Good evening. Uh, I've been thinking about the next generation of scientists and where those scientists will come from. Especially in this highly technologized world, science can seem inaccessible to children. Kids aren't doing electronics experiments in their garages anymore because electronics have shrunken down to microchip size. But I think the answer is to use nature to teach science because nature is accessible. It's all around us. And I believe there are specific things we can do to inspire children to explore the natural world. And I think we can put many of those children on the path toward careers in science. And other people are thinking of this as well. The National Bureau of Labor Statistics has found a trend over the past 10 years that there's been an increase in demand for professionals in the science, technology, engineering, and math fields, or the STEM fields. And they project that that trend is going to continue over the next 20 or 30 years, at least. And within that trend, we also see an increasing demand for professionals in environmental science. Well, I think back to how I was inspired to get into science and explore for plants. And really, it started when I was 13 years old, growing up in upstate New York. Uh, I didn't know what I was going to do when I grew up, but I, I didn't think it was science until I read this book written by David Fairchild, one of the founders of this garden. And this is called Garden Islands of the Great East. And it's a story of David Fairchild's expedition to the islands of Southeast Asia looking for plants. And when I read this book, I realized, well, there are extraordinary places on Earth that haven't been explored. And within those places, there are forms of life that are beautiful and interesting, useful. And those things need to be documented. Those things need to be conserved. So really, that changed my worldview and put me on the career path that I'm on today. But the great thing about this book, the great thing about David Fairchild's writing is that in his first chapter, he talks about his own moment of inspiration. And that happened when he was 18 years old. He was enrolled in the Kansas State Agricultural College in you know, the Midwest. He'd been in the Midwest for his entire life and had no plans to leave the Midwest until he happened to meet Alfred Russell Wallace, one of the greatest natural historians of all time. Alfred Russell Wallace had traveled the Amazon and the islands of the Pacific. Uh, but he was the first person to put into writing the theory of evolution by natural selection. What Wallace taught David Fairchild is that there are really interesting biological processes happening, interactions among organisms, but you have to go looking for them. And so within a couple of years, Fairchild left Kansas. He was on a boat to the Dutch East Indies, and that started a great career as a plant explorer. And you know, uh, Alfred Russell Wallace is known for his work uh, about evolution and the birds that he collected and described and the insects he collected and described, but he was also a prolific writer. And we know how he got his inspiration. When he was 19 years old, he was working for a railroad company in England doing survey work outdoors. And he started to notice insects and the diversity of those insects. And he started making sketches and taking notes. And then he met an entomologist, Henry Walter Bates who helped him take his observations and put them into a scientific context and think not just about the specific organisms, but how they interact with one another and the environment. And that really launched Wallace's scientific career. So if you follow this thread from Bates to Wallace to Fairchild to me, you realize that these moments of inspiration all happened as a result of random occurrences. I happened to read a book. David Fairchild happened to run into Alfred Russell Wallace. And Alfred Russell Wallace happened to meet somebody who helped him take things he was already thinking about and think about them in a different way, a scientific way. Uh, and if you think about how inspiration happens, how ideas flow from one person to another, you can compare that to the way pollen flows from one plant to another. It happens in different ways. The first plants on Earth had no flowers. They existed in a time when there were no insects or other animals to help them move pollen around. They had to rely on non-living processes, water, wind, to move pollen from one plant to another and hope that for the random chance that a pollen, grain land, a pollen grain lands in the right place on the ovule of another plant. Well, more recently, 
over the past, say, 140 million years or so, <laughs> flowers have evolved. And these are much more sophisticated ways of moving pollen from one plant to another. And with the advent of flowers has been this explosion of diversity and productivity in the plant kingdom. So you can kind of draw a comparison to the way uh, we teach science, that we could, we could go from this sort of random occurrence of these moments of inspiration and take a more sophisticated approach in the way that flowers have tipped the, tipped the odds in the favor of having pollen grains land in the right place. We can tip the odds in favor of creating those moments of inspiration in our children. And really, there are five specific ways that I believe we can do this and ways that we are doing that here. And the first is to start early with children and repeat often. And, and that means exposing them to science and nature at a very young age and bringing them back over and over again. And that just makes kids comfortable with nature, with science, and with the experimental process. The next thing we need to do is to expose children to real science, not just classroom science. That means we need to rethink, we need to re-engineer the scientific infrastructure in this country and design labs where children can come in, can see what's going on, and participate. The third thing we do is to connect students with mentors in the sciences. And what we've found is that the most effective mentors are early career scientists. Those are the college students, the graduate students, the scientists who have just made that decision to go into science. And they're the best people to communicate with middle school and high school students who might be able to make the same decisions. We also need to link science to other disciplines, particularly the arts, because kids may not know they're interested in science. They may not know they're interested in exploring nature. But if you send them out with a blank sheet of paper into the garden, they very quickly start to notice and document the intricacies of life. Um, this drawing was done by a middle school student here in one of our local schools here in Miami. And looking at this drawing, I know that she has a better understanding than anybody on the planet of how the flowers of this Musella plant can be pollinated by bees. And the fifth thing we need to do is to let the students explore on their own. We can give students a bunch of flowers, let them take them apart, see how they're structured, and think about how they might function. And this is very important, because when students investigate on their own, they take the exploration in new, unexpected places, and, and that's where inspiration really happens. So that's the formula. We introduce science early, repeat it often, we connect students with mentors in the sciences, especially early career scientists. We encourage participation in real science. We link science to other disciplines, especially the arts. And we let students explore independently. And those five strategies, we found those to be particularly effective in the context of the natural world. So now, let me tell you a story. Uh, this is the African sausage tree, Kigelia panata found in sub-Saharan Africa. It's called the sausage tree because it has these conspicuous sausage-shaped fruits that hang down from the branches. Um, and we have this species at Fairchild. But what we found in recent years is that it's not producing those sausage-shaped fruits. And what we don't have here in Miami are these nectar-eating bats. You can see one of them here sticking out its tongue, and that's what it uses to drink nectar out of tubular flowers. So you can look at this picture, you can put it together with, you know, scale it and put it together with a, a picture of the flowers of the sausage tree. And think about how in the process of drinking nectar, the bat might move pollen from one flower to another. And you can show that to a child and the child will start thinking about these processes as, as well. And that's what I did with my six-year-old daughter, Eleanor. And the great thing is I was able to bring her here to Fairchild Garden at night when these flowers open. So after thinking about the bats and what the bats might do, she set up her own experiments and started working with the flowers. Uh, and this was very rewarding because, of course, a few months later, we were able to come back and see the, the results. 
<laughs> so now you not only have our secret formula for the education programs, but you also know how the sausages are made. Uh, but this was, this was great to be able to see the results. But the extraordinary thing is that Eleanor now sees the world as a whole universe of experiments. Every time she sees a flower, she thinks about how pollen might move from one plant to another and what creatures might be involved. And that's the kind of inspiration that I think all children should have and all children can have. And that's why with our K-12 through education programs, especially the Fairchild Challenge, uh, we're reaching out to schools throughout Miami-Dade. 250 schools are involved in the Fairchild Challenge. And that, that means that about 125,000 students per year are participating. And we're using those same five principles to reach all of those students. And even when nature isn't fully accessible, they can create their own gardens and set up their own experiments at their own schools. And, well, we know this is working because we talk to the students before and after they participate in the program. And we've found that at the end of the school year, 82% of these students express uh, an increased likelihood of choosing a career in science and the environment. I think that's a terrific number. I really like that number. Because what that means is that if we keep applying these same five principles, the children of Miami can have a very important role in the future of science in this country. Thank you very much.